Into order, Madam Clerk. Here. Mr. Cater. Here. Ms. Egan. Here. Ms. Hazard. Here. Ms. Healy. Here. Mr. McCosker. Here. Ms. Young. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Dr. Kisner. Presentation of Superintendent's FY20 spending request. All right, thank you. Knowing I have three minutes, I will make sure I get right to it. Okay. So I first thank you for this opportunity. Officially or formally, I worked about two months on the budget, but truthfully, the day I started is when I worked on the budget. As I walked around the schools, talked to people, visited classrooms, um, had discussions with different stakeholders throughout the community, um, formal discussions at different advisory meetings, um, and also, just so you know how, at least I did it, which is probably not greatly different than how it was done in the past, is that there were representatives from the elementary, middle, and high school principals. They all met, they submitted their recommendation. We met with the representatives. I met with all of the uh, account managers, um, met with some of them a few times to uh, better understand their requests, discuss their priorities, and focus on um, clarity of how the budget was going to improve student learning. And you're going to see um, a little later the, s the sequence that I took to get to um, the budget that you're going to um, be presented. All right, so the goals and priorities, these will look very familiar to you. I tried as much as possible to align the school board goals and priorities with the priorities that I have submitted um, as a budget request. There will be some um, expansion, maybe some slight modifications, but overall, I hope as we uh, finish this presentation that you'll see um, some alignment with your goals and the budget. So the superintendent's budget expectations, um, again, I'm going to get into much greater detail, is staff compensation, again, to attract, retain, and develop the uh, Stafford workforce, promote a positive learning experience for every child, ensure equity and excellence, and expand learning opportunities. Um, I also make it clear that the budget has to be flexible. The day the budget is finally adopted is the day, in a sense, the budget changes because we're talking about children. So we could have a child or a group of children that move into our community that need a, ser a special services of some sort that maybe we did not anticipate in December of 2018 because the budget that w you will eventually approve goes from July 1 of 19 to June of 2020. So budgets have to be flexible. And not everything can be funded, and not everything can be funded at the requested levels. And I will show you the requested level to the final level, okay? And on Saturday, I'm going to uh, pr provide you, you'll get all the budget documents and everything for Saturday's work session. You will see every single request that um, I received, okay? So you'll have a clear understanding <coughs> of what people ask for. To address growth, um, looked at class size, protect and enhance our physical assets, close achievement gaps by supporting targeted in interventions. Um, you had a little presentation last week. To meet the required needs of children with disabilities. So I'm gonna walk you through tonight a lot of data. Uh, and the reason I wanna do that is because I could get very, uh, uh, I could be very comfortable talking about the passion and emotional side of <coughs> of teaching and learning, but I think it's also important to understand what's driving the budget. And a lot of what's driving the budget is um, facts that can't be denied, okay? And they could all be um, a reference if people are looking for it. Um, support the needs of children with disabilities, strengthen administrative building support, continue supporting the school board staffing initiatives, address compensation study recommendations, provide more targeted professional development and funds, and, and Chris and I have been working on different formulas to make f sure that funds are distributed around students' needs and equity, okay? I want to just touch quickly on the professional development component. I have always said and I've always believed if you do it correctly, 
If you don't do it correctly, it's not effective. But if you look at professional development in the business world, often it would be called a research and design, um, research and development. If you look at how we improve student learning to meet the needs of our students today and tomorrow, we have to be prepared to invest in our staff so they have the skills and tools and resources to be effective. And there's no question when you take a look at Stafford 10, 15 years ago to where we are today, there are changes. You know that. But um, sometimes we, we, we tend to forget that our student population in 1920 looks, you know what, I would use the word significantly different from 19 to, uh, 1999 to 2000. First, the focus on academic, social, emotional needs of all children is the first and foremost what's driving on this budget. Uh, some of those pictures you might recognize because they were on some of our trips when we went to visit the buildings. All right, state of the division. Now, I just want to mention something that I, I, is great. Uh, all our schools are fully accredited. So I want to applaud your effort and all of our staff and parents. But I also want to be honest about that, okay? So school divisions are not accredited. Schools are accredited. 92% of the schools in Virginia are accredited, okay? And I bring that up because sometimes I hear, well, our budget is already meeting all the needs of our children. All our schools are accredited, and which is true. But it's a lot more than just accreditation. And then the other thing that I'm hoping you're aware of, the entire accreditation system has completely changed. This year, every school division was given an option. You could continue on your old accreditation system, or you could start the new accreditation system, and you selected to the one that was the most advantageous for your school. Next year, that option is not available. So now, how we're going to be assessed how we're going to be evaluated, all 133 school systems, is looking at growth of individual subgroups and also looking at other indicators like attendance, like dropout, like discipline, and so on. So whatever we did up to this point, let's celebrate, let's be happy. But I could also tell you, without getting to specifics tonight, we have some schools in Stafford so the new system is basically a one, two, three, or, or a green, yellow, red system. We have some schools that I would suggest if we don't change the trajectory, they may not meet what, the accreditation as we have known it in the past. And I think our budget begins a very serious discussion on how we make the changes for that to occur. Other things that we should be proud of, of course, is our dropout rate is better than the state average. Our on-time graduation rate is better than the state average. Um, you put in a K-12 improvement model with goal, measurable goals. We have over 4,000 students getting credentialed, um, CTE credentials. And of course, you know, we've had uh, a teacher, one of the state teachers of the year, and we had a Washington Post principal of the year. So we have a lot to celebrate. So other things, we made some improvements on technology with computer upgrades. That is an example of where equity has to be looked at. We sat in this room a couple of months ago with all the PTO leaders and PTA leaders, and we heard firsthand, which is absolutely accurate, that in certain schools, based on the ability of PTOs to uh, raise money, they have a different level of technology than maybe some others. And that should not be the way we operate as a school system. So we are working with our new technology director and finance and instructional staff on how we can make, how that, how that discontinues. How technology is based on the learning needs of children, not the ability to raise funds. Again, um, I won't take the time to read all this because I know you could read it, but you see that we have um, a lot to, uh, to be happy with. So let's take a snapshot in time where we were in 2009, our enrollment, uh, you know, over 26,000. Um, this year, our ADM projection is, so this does not include preschool, okay? 
Our ADM projection is 28,934. We feel pretty <coughs> comfortable at this point that we're gonna reach that projection. And next year we're projecting, uh, this is ADM, which is different than enrollment, okay? Um, we're projecting 29,351. That is a, um, from 2009 to 2018, we went up to 2,137 students, which is a little bit over 8%. So you're gonna see, because um, this is just the beginning of some of the data to help better understand my budget request to the school board. Again, some of you have seen this before. This was discussed in FAB. So we're, we're taking the position that, uh, and I'll show you data in a few minutes, but you have already seen, that when teachers leave Stafford, truthfully, they're really just going mainly to two different school divisions, Prince William and Spotsylvania County. Um, we took a look at where they've been go within 60 miles. If they go further than 60 miles, it's often a life change, a family job has changed, they may be, um, uh, you know, just moved um, for other reasons. But when you look at where they've gone in, in 60 miles, the top bar, of course, represents Spotsylvania. The middle bar represents the average, I mean, I'm sorry, the top bar represents Prince William. The middle bar represents an average of Prince William and Spotsylvania. The bottom bar kind of merges but what you could see at the bottom bar is at towards the latter part of the scale, um, Spotsylvania actually begins to pull ahead of um, Stafford. Now, I will tell you, and I have said this publicly and privately to people, I'm not here to race to compete with Prince William. That's just realistically, Prince William, not only that scale um, higher than ours, but they have a scale which you're aware of that is 30 years. We are at 37, 38 years to get to the top. In Prince William, we get to 30. But I think, I feel strongly that we want to acknowledge and recognize the profession and the hard work of a lot of our teachers. That's why they deserve um, a, a better raises um, than what I think um, we've been able to do in the past. So where have our teachers gone? Um, again. You see the 1718, the 1617 data, and that just again highlights that the two school systems, I chose to leave Fairfax out of it, but if we put Fairfax in it, you would also see that they would be higher than Stafford. But you get a, a sense of where they're going within 60 miles of Stafford County. And again, just another representation of that same piece of data. So I also wanted to take a look at, because we have a lot of discussions about student to teacher ratios. This information you could get off the Department of Ed website. The only thing I want to caution you, the dark line is K seventh grade. The state just basically has elementary and secondary. So if you take a look at our um, teacher to student ratio, and this includes counselors, librarians, art, music, it's not just the classroom teacher. I'm not gonna overly interpret this, except to tell you that um, if you look at the K seventh grade, and I think if we really digged into it, it would probably be driven more by sixth and seventh grade, that um, you know our staff to student ratio um, is, is higher than our neighboring school divisions. So, I bring this slide up not to say anything except to share the information, okay? And the information is that the way we educate a student is, um, uh, is by how much we receive, and then the state has a formula that looks at every school division and they subtract out capital outlay and they give you your per pupil expenditure. And the per pupil expenditure, I think, tells a telling story of why we might not be able to do as much as maybe other school divisions are able to do or what we would like to do. So what you have is our neighboring school systems and you have the state median and the state average. 
And if I could just tell you, if we just met the median, just met the median, we would have $21.5 million more in our budget. And if we just work to be average, and you know how I feel about average, okay? <laughs> but if we just work to be average, we would have $47.5 million more in our budget. So one of the things under your goals, under budget, is to work with the Board of Supervisors on budget clarity, so maybe some budget goals, and I don't think it would be a bad thing over time to have a good conversation with our, um, uh, our Board of Supervisors to talk about this number, not to suggest that they're not trying to support the school system. They are trying to support the school system. And I believe um, there's, there's uh, a great interest uh, by all seven members of the Board of Supervisors to see our school system be the best in the Commonwealth but for me as superintendent and to be able to provide, and I'll give you an example. I mentioned this the other night, but I think it's important and I think it's telltale. Our middle school, I just want to say, because I think, you know, we talk about salaries, but there's also something about the quality of your working condition. So our middle school teachers, and I understand it might have been a history a long time ago, we gave them a choice, but why even have a choice on um, the schools? That they eat in the cafeteria while their students eat. I think for 20, 25 minutes, whatever long, however long lunch is, we should have cafeteria monitors, whatever the terminology we use in Stafford, and allow these very hardworking professionals to have 20, 25 minutes where they're not hearing the kids, they don't have to worry about, they need, a, they need a, their own time out. And I understand in one way, you mentioned last meeting, why foreign language discontinued, and we have other, many other examples. So that's why the per pupil expenditure is very important because that's what we use to educate a child in Stafford, and that's what everyone else uses. And just so you know, I'm trying to do two things at once. Out of 133 school system, we rank 95th in per pupil expenditure. Okay, so. I think it would be a reasonable goal to try to get least to the middle. Um, and honestly, why not even be better than that? But so let's take a look, other look at data, things that we've been interested, we've talked about over the um, course of the last six months, five months. Um, our bus drivers, um, you could see the rates there. These are the starting rates compared to some of our neighboring school systems. Bus drivers are not any different to the teachers if they choose to go somewhere else, um, it's going to be one of these two school divisions. If you take a look at a six and a half hour day, and you could see the numbers, our drivers would be making a little bit under 18,000. In Spotsylvania, they'd be making close to 19,000. And Prince William, they'd be making over 22,000. So what's driving a lot of the budget uh, besides when I get into the salary benefits, but this has to be recognized, is that as our student population increases, so does our population for students with disabilities. And truthfully, we're at about 12%. The state average is about 12%. So the last couple of years, we've actually been below the state average, but just to put it in context, I can't tell you right now um, exactly what disabilities represent that increase of you know, over 200 just from one year. But if we just for a moment even took a quarter of that and say they were low incident disabilities, 50, and we have about eight to children to a classroom with a paraprofessional, you could see how, that, how it multiplies for children with disabilities. To get into more specific, look, these are the categories that we're seeing the greatest growth. So you see children with autism, you see children with emotional disabilities. Uh, other health impaired is generally your children, not all, but children with attention deficit disorder, it's other disabilities also, and then children with learning disabilities. So you get a better sense of not only why these children uh, deserve, but also require um, specialized uh, instruction and attention, but also that then drives 
resources, such as occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language, and so on. Okay, so I just want to also let you know that this budget is highly dependent on the state budget. And we're using the proposed budget by the governor. And, um, and you know, there's some good news happening there that you might have read in the paper this morning that the House, um, the Appropriation Committee, um, at least on the salary part of the governor's budget, has voted to support that. So it's still too early, but I want you, like all superintendents, I believe, we go by the latest information we have in December of 2018, the governor presented uh, his budget. But what you could see again, um, you know, the this is all instructional positions um, in Virginia, you know, how's increased. So um, from FY 2001 to FY uh, 2019, um, you, you can see the growth, the compound annual rate of 2.6 versus 3.0 growth. Um, you can see state cuts. Um, we're really not at the level that we were in 2009 um, in, uh, uh, in Virginia for um, supporting education. You can see the average instructional pay in Virginia has grown less than the rate of inflation. Um, if, if instructional pay has grown at the rate of the CPI, we would have um, a $62,000 going towards instruction. Now, state aid is very important to us because that's where we get majority of our funding, okay? So that's why it has um, very important context. Most locality revenue sources have not kept up with inflation and population growth despite median real estate property taxes. So again, the median real estate, real property tax rates increased 17 cents for cities and 12 cents for counties since FY 2009. So the counties are trying as much as possible to make up the difference of where the state has um, fallen behind. And then you could see again the slower growth in K-12 funding, um, the localities for school construction that, um, again is a you know pretty much uh, the state basically puts no money in for school construction now it's important was because sometimes people um, get confused when they see the governor's budget of standards of quality it's the minimum standards of quality and somewhere between it's about 60 to 70 percent that you will see school divisions and Chris is, and his team is are trying to get the exact number and maybe he already has it in Stafford but I will assure you will fall somewhere between 60 and 70% of positions um, uh, in our county and our school division are standards of quality positions, positions that you are required to have. They're minimum, okay? So when the budget is presented by the governor and he says that I'm adding 2% more for teacher raises, you understand, I know you understand sometimes the public doesn't, I truly grasp this idea. He is speaking about the standard of quality positions. Um, but all school divisions, when they give raises, they give it to all staff. They don't just say those that are standard of quality and those are not. Our composite index is about 0.34. So another way to look at it for every dollar required to spend on a SLQ position or program, we get about 66 cents from the state. Okay, so it's not even um, that it's all funded by um, the state. We get a portion of it. Now, Stafford, every school division, every community exceeds the local required effort because, again, it's the um, minimum standards of quality. And I, will, I do want to point out that Stafford is at that exceeding 100% of the required local effort. Um, they are with 46 other school systems, and then again, you could see um, how it breaks down. I would just speculate, because we have a low composite index, that um, it's somewhat, um, I don't want to use the word easier, but you'll see that those maybe have lower composite index. Um, you could exceed the local required effort um, 
at a higher level just based on what you're required to um, fund your schools. However, that number doesn't help us educate a child. What helps educate a child is our per pupil expenditure. Okay? Um, but I do want to recognize and thank the county because we are at, um, we are one of those 46 school systems that exceeded by 46%. So what was in the governor's budget? As I already mentioned, 87 million for salary increases. So how it works this year, if, if that doesn't get approved, uh, you, last year you gave about 2.5%. We would have to really average it out. I suspect it will come out higher than 2.5% because you gave some staff higher than that. If, if, this, two point, if this additional 2% is not um, approved, but just for the simplicity of this conversation, if it was just 2.5%, we would only be required to give a 0.5% to draw the state share. If the 2% additional money, then we would have to give at minimum 2.5% to get the 5%. Um, literacy fund, $80 million for school construction loans. Oh, please, that's one school, um, but it's a start. So one of the other things that you'll see in my budget, I really believe this is an issue that is about safety. And let me just be honest with you, we are probably one of the strongest school systems as it goes to security as a physical plant. But I could tell you my four months here, and this is not unique to Stafford, the safety issues we've been dealing with are our children in the buildings. It's not people coming into the buildings. It's children making threats. It's children, you heard many parents speak up about issues of bullying. It's, it's safety is knowing that you come to a school and you are free of threat and distraction and you're not worried about being harmed by others. And what our school system needs to really embrace is having more staff that could work with the social emotional needs of children. So even before, maybe the governor was following me, even before the governor was working towards improving the ratio right now at the elementary level, it's one per 500. And over time, next year, his budget has one to 375. And the following year, it would reach the one to 250 children. One of the middle schools the other day was dealing with two children that took a lot of our time because they were struggling, okay? They were very much struggling. And the principal, I felt, did a, uh, and her staff did an amazing job addressing it. But I asked a question, like, how many school counselors do you have? And it's a middle school close to 900 children, just two school counselors. Th that's, that, um, that was new to me, I, I just will tell you. Um, so we are, um, uh, in the budget, you're going to see uh, an investment in uh, the mental health, the emotional needs of our children, and I really believe that falls in, into a, a, a safety um, component. Again, um, you could read the rest of the budget. Uh, the two big things I just want to point out was the salaries and the school counselors. So. What's kind of somewhat interesting, a little different than maybe what I just said earlier, the history in Stafford's a little different on how the state versus the local budget. Actually in Stafford, the state budget has been a incremental increase of the budget and the local budget has gone in the opposite direction. Um, so um, you could see the portion of the school budget from local funds 2011, it was at 45.2 percent. You could follow the line, and in 2019, it's 41.7 percent. Um, so um, I'm just providing the facts. Okay, I'm not judging. I think people could make their own um, conclusions, but as I sp just spent 10 minutes talking about the state not contributing. I want to at least recognize that in our community, the state has actually, it's gone up and the locality has gone down, okay? So the total operating budgets since 2011, um, again, you could see 
uh, the increase. This is the budget that you adopted after the Board of Supervisors has given you your final number. And you could see um, the operating fund expenditures. This is obviously nothing tied with capital. Okay, so let's talk about what I'm presenting. Although that's not, I'm already seeing one slight um, uh, change. I'm recommending 5% for all employees except school administrators and central office administrators. There I'm seeking 3%, okay? My preference would be um, a 5%, but after um, uh, reducing positions and positions, I felt like I could not reduce any additional positions. So it's, um, and, and uh, we'll see this later. This is um, tier um, one requests. Don't get nervous about that $38 million. That's where I started with all the requests, okay? All right. So it, it was started at 13.39% of all the requests I got. You'll see I end at tier seven, okay? Um, compensation study. Uh, now I understand. Compensation study phase one, initially in tier one, was 75,000. Now that we've had more information, you're going to see that number is going to um, go up, okay? Other sc scale adjustments, s nurses that have a bachelor's degree and a registered nurse, um, I believe they should be on a teacher scale. We already have great difficulty attracting RNs, um, but it's a bachelor, uh, RNs with a bachelor's degree. Referral bonuses, so I've seen this work in school systems. I've been a superintendent where it worked. One of the best way to attract staff is other staff recruiting for you. People graduate a university, they have friends, they've gone to associations. They say, hey, Stafford, great place, my school, terrific. You make a, they make a referral, we employ them, we decide a length of time that they have to work for us to be effective, and if they're effective, um, we give the person who referred them a, um, a bonus. Tuition assistance, we want our staff, learning is not just for children, it's for the adults too. And as um, we ask people to take classes to be, um, have the knowledge and skills, um, right now our tuition reimbursement, um, you know, we do have a tuition reimbursement, but we, we put some additional money to support that. Okay, so as I mentioned, started at tier one, and you'll see all the tiers, and I end at tier seven. And tier seven looks a lot different than tier one. So here's my request. All right, so we're using ADM of 29,351, state revenue of uh, 11,679,000 over this year, which is 7.23%, federal revenue, most of the federal revenue clarity will happen over the summer, but we already have some indication of, of some addition. So we see 115,000 more. And um, don't worry, I didn't get to local yet. And then that's an increase. Um, and then the other revenue that we get for like renting out the buildings and so on, um, about 215,000 more. State revenue, we're going to use uh, 75 more students than the state is projecting for ADM. Um, we're pretty f confident that the state uh, is uh, lower than what we're anticipating. Our enrollment projection goes up 150, um, more than what the state is saying. So we're going to go in the middle, okay? 5% um, compensation supplement, funds for additional counselors. Regional special ed funding, let me just touch upon that real quickly. So Stafford does not belong to a regional special ed partnership with any other school divisions. And a lot of school divisions that do not belong to a, a regional special ed um, program have raised a concern to the Department of Ed, why are all these school systems getting additional funding and we're educating the same children and, and the costs are the same? Now, I have to tell you, when I was in Harrisonburg, I used to argue the other way, because we had a regional program. I said, leave us, stop being jealous of us. 
But the big school, the, the school systems that argued that regional special ed funding should be distributed to all school divisions have won the narrative. So we are anticipating ad additional funding doesn't mean anything except we may have to have some memorandums of understanding and with another school division, specifically now we're talking about Spotsylvania, because believe it or not, Fredericksburg has one with Prince William. I don't know how we got jumped over. So if we uh, create an arrangement with Spotsylvania, then we, um, we could see as, as realize as much as uh, 400,000 um, extra state dollars in special ed. I will tell you, one of the ways the state is able to do this, they do decrease our ADM of the children that are in the regional program, but that 400,000 I mentioned has already taken that into account. So um, we have been meeting with Paul Raskoff from the Department of Ed, and it's pretty much a go. Um, and soon you will be asked to um, uh, approve um, some type of memorandum. Okay, and we also have some other uh, expenditure rebates. Um, okay, so superintendent, school counselors and other mental health staff are critical to address school safety. I mentioned that, work with families. So again, our middle schools, most of my uh, budget requests are focusing on the middle school. We have, um, I, you know, again, 10 month administrators. Summer is critical. You do professional development, you do recruiting, you do curriculum work. And we have um, seven of our eight middle schools have a, a 10 month or maybe 10 month, 10 day administrator. Uh, I really believe they should be 12 months. And truthfully, what I'm noticing in my short time here, a lot of those people wait for the next job. You know, so um, I'm hoping we can make all building administrators 12 months. We have them at the elementary school, we have them at the high school. For some reason we just don't have all of them at the elementary school. So, what's that? At the middle school, yeah. So additional staff for new middle school model. Let me, let me just, we'll have more time to discuss that, but we have done and we appreciate the feedback you gave us and, and we've taken it seriously and we've done some preliminary research. I just wanted to know, we looked at eight school divisions that we would all consider high quality school divisions no one has a double block of English and double block of math. M many of them have the model that we have presented to you. And what's important, as I shared, and they shared the data, and I say this great, with great respect, there's two groups of children I feel are being adversely impacted in our current model. The child that's very advanced and the child that's struggling. And I recognize it's new. We all recognize it's new. Um, we'll talk more about it, but I just wanted to mention that learning gaps are not going to change by just hoping and wishing. We have to do something different. And the conversation that has been taking place for the last year and mainly the last couple of months, I think is a very good start of acknowledging that within our student population, there are a group of children not doing as well as they could have or should have, and there's another group of students that we're holding back by not differentiating at the level that we should. That's my only commentary on that for now. Additional staff to meet the needs of children with disabilities, you'll see that. Additional school buses. So I, one of the things that I would like to maybe entertain a conversation with a board of supervisors, maybe do more research on this, there's buses and some other um, one of the things that I did not put in the budget that we absolutely need is a whole new telephone system. Uh, there's not a week that doesn't go by that some school system is emailing us, the phones are down. Our phone system is so, um, for those who remember uh, Andy and Mayberry with Aunt B, I mean, we might as well, we, we kind of have a system like that. But we don't, it's over $2 million to upgrade all our phones. And we have two new schools that are going through the infrastructure thing, Moncure and North Star. And you know, we should begin this conversation early so we have alignment. But buses and things like that, should they come out of the operating budget or should they come out of the capital budget? And that's a question that I think we should ask because we have 11 buses, 10 buses that you bought, that you had addition this year, and we're adding another one. That's over a million dollars. 
okay? And we factor in about sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars per staff. That's 16 staff members that we believe we have, but buses are also critically important. So I think it's a conversation to at least have, maybe we should do some more exploring on how school divisions do it, but this is truthfully the first place that I've worked where buses are part of the operating budget, not part of the capital um, discussion. Not saying what you're doing is wrong, but I'm saying it should at least be part of the conversation as we move forward with the Board of Supervisors. All right, compensation. Um, I'm sorry, Chris, you did it right. I just, you know, I just ha had my ADHD moment. I jumped up too quickly. 5% for all teachers uh, and support staff, 3% for administrators. Um, compensation study one, I t mentioned the teacher. The, the referral program is directed to teachers and bus drivers. Um, is that me? No, somebody else. Okay. Uh, expanded tuition assistance. Right now, we're not anticipating any major. Um, changes to our health and dental. There's a meeting in February. Um, I already mentioned the middle school uh, guidance administrative assistance, the nurse scale, um, contractual increases, um, funds for buses and infrastructure projects. I put up, I think, 125000 in for the firefighting program. That's, I met with the, f uh, the fire chief. I believe um, they put in 125000 So um, it's already in our program of studies. So if that uh, if that is supported, um, we put our share in. All right, so now mention the position. So remember, I showed you the trend of special ed over time. Um, these, so the only positions that I moved forward, so you know, in that category, there was a lot more requested are ones that are mandated, the ones that are required, okay? The diagnosticians you recognize as, as a, as a um, a program that you have supported. Um, so we put the five FTs in that. And again, you could read, um, you could read the rest of it, but the special ed, the diagnosticians are not required, but that's been a staffing um, goal for the school board. And to finish that, it would take five FTs. 17.6 counselors um, across the grade levels. Another thing that I'm not a huge fan of, and I'm, I'm sure you're not a huge fan either, we have some counselors that are not full-time members of their school. And it's relationship building. You're building relationships with the parents, your relationship with the teachers, with relationship with the children, and they're among different schools. So um, the 17.6 uh, gets us to a better place than where we are today for our 30 plus schools. Um, and again, it's, it's very contingent upon um, the governor's budget. Growth in class size initiative. Um, again, uh, you could read that. The middle school, I want to just give clarity on that. The middle school, even if we were not uh, doing the uh, design, we want to get our class sizes in the core subjects um, down to uh, a goal of 25 um, per teacher, okay? So that gets us closer there. Um, there are four positions in that 15 that I mentioned last week um, that are foreign language. Um, initially, we were hoping, or they were hoping to have eight positions, one per school, but as a transition, it would be uh, half per school. Um, again, the high school, um, in the detail, that's again focusing more on math and science. Uh, again, we have some, some schools that are teaching some subjects, Others that are, others are not, and in some cases, um, our class sizes um, might be too high. As our population grows, so do as our programs to support children that need a different model. And alternative ed is a um, is a good example, and a pro and a teacher for ch uh, children where English is a second language. North Star um, again, you could read that a nurse and two assistants. You know about the procurement. We, we have to address that. Um, so I want to just, uh, uh, we're working on some of the things now. We've also, as openings have come in the central office, instead of filling the opening automatically based on where the person left, I've been shifting some people around, okay, to help meet some of our needs. We've had people the last few months who have left us 
and, and not automatically, um, I know Sri, she's very happy I've done it. I, I took one of her staff members <laughs> recently. So, um, but we have other priorities, okay? And, and so we're, we're, we're moving people around as we see it. So one of the most exciting programs, so I presented um, uh, to the Business Advisory Council and just so you know, we're growing that Business Advisory Council. We're actually having our next meeting in March at, at um, North Stafford High School, and there's going to be new members. And we're really talking about, we, we, have, we have this in place now, but we want to go deeper and really better understand what we have now. But children, high school students really working and learning and mentoring out in the community. Um, this is also in the um, profile of the graduate a uh, priority. So there's a one position for um, that ready uh, workplace readiness. I guess, I don't know when, but a few years ago we reduced high school administrative assistance. Uh, high schools are growing. We want to put that back. Uh, transportation, you know everything that's happening in transportation. They need more support and help. Um, another dispatcher. Um, oh, what the heck they call it? Low voltage. Is that right? Low voltage. Yeah, low voltage. Um, somebody who does low voltage work, don't even ask what that is. I guess that's changing a light bulb, but we're putting that position in there. Uh, technology. So I mentioned the telephone system, and it's much more than just a telephone system. It's a communication system. It's a safety system. Um, a lot of our, you know, when the phones go down, we lose access, uh, communication with, um, with staff. Um, that's a concern. Uh, the phone systems have done correctly. People could communicate with parents much easier and so on. Messages could be left in classrooms. There's a system of analysts that technology wants. That's that voice um, telephone system. And student services, um, they lost a position. We have parents that come in that um, are going through the uh, registration evaluation procedures and we've had to move staff around so um, these parents could be greeted and processed. All right, so we've also had reductions, uh, reinvest uh, 1.7 million in compensation benefits, salary lapse, and as I already mentioned, we did some redirecting of staffing. So my request uh, is a total expenditure of 308 million, increase of uh, 18 million, 543,000, 6.4 percent, um, 92 positions versus the 130 something that was asked. Increase in counting funding, just so you know, um, I don't know how it'll end up, but if you look at the last uh, 10 or 12 years, um, this is one of the lowest requests as a percentage of the budget from the county, but 6.6 percent, .6 a little bit under $8 million. Um, again, if you Look ahead, what um, I'm proposing, um, now we'll fill in the 2020, I left that out before, is again a 6.4% increase versus a 3.9 and so on that you've received in previous years. The local funding, again, um, uh, slightly uh, increases over previous years, but surely is not at the level it was um, at other points in time. Eighty-four percent of our budget goes to compensation benefits, which is not unusual. That's usually what school systems have between 80 and 85 percent. What's really good, state wants you to have 65 percent of your budget going toward instruction. We have 76 percent of our budget going toward instruction. So some of the things that I just will kind of begin to wrap up. This is a journey. I don't want this to be a one-time event. If we want to maintain experienced teachers and leadership workforce, we have to collectively think of different ways to um, make this a place where people don't want to leave, okay? Um, we have to constantly develop our talent, all people. Um, we need, so review and adjust regulations affecting employees. This is one I really think I'll bring, I don't know if, if it's a school board policy or it's a regulation or I'm used to regul boards adopting policies, superintendents um, do regulations. 
But we have something which is counterintuitive to me. We know we have a difficulty attracting teachers. And we know, as I already shared with you, especially if you go north of us, we're the lowest paid school system north of us. But we cap 20 years of experience. So if you're from, if you're from Fairfax, Arlington, Prince William, and you want to work in Stafford, you're already making more than you would make here at the same step. But we cap you at 20 years. So you would not only make less just based on the number of steps, but if you were 24, 26, 21 year experienced teacher, we would put you on 20 years in Stafford. So I don't understand why we do that. We want teachers and we want experienced teachers. We have a cap. I could maybe understand if we were the highest paid school system and somebody wants to come for their last three years to get the VRS benefit, maybe then it would make sense. But it surely doesn't make sense right now. And another example that I will share with you, which was the number one thing that someone approached me the day I got here. And then I asked Lisa to do research and um, is our hybrid model. Our hybrid model as it relates to sick days. We had at one time, you only could carry over 12, now you could carry over 24. And I was trying to figure out, and I understand the rationale uh, if it relates to long-term disability, but most people who need to take sick days, especially in an organization where most of our employees are mothers, <coughs> women, you're taking time off because you have a sick child, you might be sick, whatever. Now people are taking care of, of an older generation. So we have 24 sick days, that's all you could carry over. And we researched a lot of school system. Most don't ha have no cap. And those that do have caps have it higher than 24. So I, I would like to least, you know, Chris has done a nice job explaining to me, but I'd like us to try to remove any barriers that are preventing people um, to come and make people feel once they get here. And the other concern I have is if you lose it at 24, and I'm not saying anybody's doing this, but I could, some, I could think of people thinking about it. If I'm gonna lose it, then, then why don't I just use it, okay? Um, but I'm not saying anybody's doing that, but I can understand. New state and federal mandates. So again, if, uh, hopefully uh, last year you had a presentation on a new state accountability and federal accountability system. And if not, we absolutely need to do that. It's completely different, completely different. Two laws went into effect. July 1 of 2018, so we obviously have to meet that. Our student population is ever-changing, um, from English language learners to uh, children with disability, uh, mental health, CT offerings to reflect changing opportunities, improve organizational efficiencies, support critical infra infrastructure upgrades like the telephones, see clarity of operational versus capital budget needs, and develop it, and I think there's an interest by the Board of Supervisors, we had a meeting last week, um, and they seem to have an interest to develop a funding strategy and goals, and I think that would, um, you know, personally, I think that would be helpful. And I said this a couple weeks ago, and I just wanted to just re restate it. The budget has to focus on the main thing, which is children learning, okay? And, um, and, and as much as I'm uh, glad to be a superintendent of a school system where all our schools are accredited, you heard Tom say this last week, that still means there's a lot of kids not learning, okay? There's a lot of kids not, be, it only takes 70% of the kids to pass to be accredited. And, um, and I could tell you, uh, working with Pam and her team, we have some schools that are going in the wrong way. And, some of it is due, in my opinion, uh, maybe not having the training they needed to the new student population. Some things may be tied to leadership. There could be a lot of different factors. But the budget focus needs to be um, on children learning. And I wanna leave you, uh, Ken Robinson, if you're not familiar with his work, he's a author and a researcher from England. The fact is that given the challenge we face, we face Education does not need to be reformed. It needs to be transformed. The key to this transformation is not to standardize education, but to personalize it, to build achievement on discovering the individual talents of each child, 
to put students in an environment where they want to learn and where they can naturally discover their true passions. And I really believe that this school system in many cases is doing that, but I think we could truthfully as a partnership with the community make this a place that we really would be the best school system, not only in Virginia, but um, I'll say the world, why stop at United States? You see the pictures there, um, and there's one of us as a happy group. So anyway, that's, that, those were our kids. We, 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 I have to tell you, I, I can't thank you enough. I'm still visiting buildings almost every day, and um, every day I get more excited knowing not only what I see our teachers and students doing, but also knowing the opportunities that are out there. So Saturday, um, we will have your budget books. I have the PowerPoint now. I didn't want to give it to you because you might have just gone, if you're like me, I would just go to the last page and, and skip everything else. So um, I'll give this to Missy. And, Monday, and what I would ask you to do, I, so I listened to last year's presentation and, and maybe you're stealing the program from the Davis, but she concluded by saying, if there's anything you want to have before our workshop, our um, to get it to the superintendent, and if you do that this way, we could use next Saturday, uh, this Saturday um, in a more valuable time. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kisner. Does anyone have any comments or questions they want to raise now, or you want to hold them until Saturday? I'll hold mine until Saturday. No? All right. Well, that will conclude the superintendent's budget presentation. Do we want to take a few minute break before we move in? Mrs. <laughs> Egan says yes. Yes, all right. Uh, all in favor, aye. aye. <laughs> um, no opposed, I hear. Well, we will be back at 8 o'clock to start the uh, work session on the redistricting. And for those of you who came for this, um, our consultant has advised us they were unable to come tonight because of the weather. Um, but they are on standby for um, Saturday if we uh, determine that we want to continue this work session until that point and want their presence. See it.
We have made. What are you speaking about? Part two of the uh, old redistricting. We do, we do. Yes, sir. All right. We call the work session to order. We don't need a roll call, right? Or do we? No. Well, the gang's all here. All right. Well, here we are. The consultant is on the phone, correct? Ms. Mather, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear us all right? I think so. We'll try to take it. All right, and we set this work session so we could discuss the process, and I'll, I'll say where do we go from here, if that's uh, acceptable. I mean, well, we're here to talk about where we are. We, we, we have two proposals, neither of which has uh, gotten any kind of anywhere near unanimous support. Um, we have a lot of comments, a lot of suggestions, a lot of concerns that have been raised by the community. I think we all have our own um, concerns with most likely overlap with a lot of that has been raised. Um, we need to decide and, and I use that term loosely because this is a work session and no decisions will be coming out of here, but we need to put ourselves in a position where we can be moving forward um, to give direction to the consultants as to what our expectation is of them. So what I thought I'd do, if, unless anyone has any other suggestions, which are welcome, is um, you know just to give everyone an opportunity I can't, to address I can't their concerns. Not here. Well, no. She'll have to watch tomorrow morning. I mean, this this will be available on our website tomorrow morning. I guess that everybody that speaks, if we speak into the microphone, then perhaps there'll be better 
hearing on that part. So does anyone have any other suggestions other than to start? Um, everyone giving some comments, concerns, and then having a dialogue once we get through the board? Ms. Egan, suggestions? Um, Scott, would you happen to have a copy for each of us of the policy that includes the criteria that has been established for redistrictings in Stafford County Public Schools? We can certainly make that. It's very easy. I can get it to you in a few minutes and go and print yeah. it. Why don't but we you, put it certain on the electronic. I'd, I'd like to have a hard copy in my hand just so I can write notes on it and circle things and when we sure. get to that portion. Yeah, absolutely. We can get that. Okay. Before you, uh, give us about five minutes. Okay. And meanwhile, if you want to pull it up so we can have it for general information, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Any other requests? No, I asked, I asked Ms. Egan to print this. Or yeah. Requests in general. Okay. <laughs> so I was thinking, I'm like, okay. that's an open question. <laughs> no, there's no coffee, Ms. Hazard. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Anybody else need anything for background or referral for the work session? While they're, while they're working on that, I'd also like to see what was given to the consultant. What did they use in their list of criteria? Um, how did they develop the plans that they did based on what staff instructed them to kind of choose from? Well, staff, um, if I may. Dr. Kisser, um, staff did not uh, direct the consultant to provide anything from a criteria perspective. They outlined the criteria that they were going to follow in the proposal that was presented to the school board. They also replicated that criteria again in um, two or three presentations that they provided before the town hall meetings, or I should say two rather. And so that criteria was, was established in several forums that the consultant had with the school board. But we did not say, we certainly furnished them with the policy that outlined the 17 um, things to consider when redistricting. Um, but we did not provide them any direction on criteria. They presented it uh, to you uh, during the proposal. Then when we had the work session with them, uh, they also identified the criteria. And that was, um, I think, passed on to the board through Dr. Kisner. We can't get into board docs for some reason. Can uh, the school board send up an email that you asked for printed for you? Yeah, policy. We'll get you a hard copy. <clears throat> what is this? It's not sufficient. Okay, found it. Thanks. So we should go to 1403, which has the under policies. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. Can we can we start here? So, if we if we had had a, a another get together to talk about what we wanted to include in the redistricting um, criteria, this is where we would have all come together. We would have sat together and pulled out what was important to us. Um, I remember um, Ms. Hazard had said at one of our board meetings that there's 17 of them, and clearly we'd have to narrow them down. Um, at a certain point, um, that didn't happen. So it's nearly impossible, and we learned that from the last two redistrictings, to actually incorporate all 17. Um, but I think it's important, based on all of the feedback that we've gotten from our constituents, and whatever belief you had, you know, out of the gate already, um, to go back and look at this and pull out maybe one or two, three items maybe, and kind of 
use those to have a little group think and narrow it down a little, maybe even a little bit further, and then ask the, the consultant to go back and take what the, that criteria is and maybe do maybe three more um, options. Anybody? Okay, so for instance, my, my two things are um, trying to keep the communities together as much as possible and bus distances and, and bus times, those are the, probably the two most important things for me. And if I had to put a third one in there, it would probably be the, the F&R um, redistribution um, to make it a little bit more even. And socioeconomic characteristics of school <coughs> I guess. I'm just, just looking for what's on there. That yeah, that. I guess that's what's, what it's under, yeah, so. so. So what would be the intent of that? I mean, just to try to flesh these out, because if we are going to send them back, I think we're going to have to give some, you know, fairly specific direction to the consultants if we're going to get something that, you know. Yeah, meet, I'm just going backwards to, to when, when, I, when I supported the idea of having a consultant do this, I, I had a very clear, you know, process in my head on how it was going to play out, of which none occurred. So what I'm trying to do is kind of go back a couple of steps and then maybe start again with some of the stuff that we, the seven of us, through input from our constituents, want to see in the redistricting plans. That's it. So, I, I, I think Dr. Right. Chase was first, then we'll oh. go to you. One, two, three. Sorry. Yeah, so I guess the question is, can we um, give the consultants sort of instructions to incorporate this with where they are right now and then run their model again to put that in place? Or in addition to? Or in addition to, does that? So, I mean, I, I had suggested that uh, we've had staff give us program capacities once you've adjusted for the fact that some schools are now substan are now class size reduction schools and some are not. Right. And that I would like them to be able to take that into consideration. But I know it's difficult because you move people and suddenly it changes again. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Ms. Young. <clears throat> I've always been concerned about the number, the high numbers of free and reduced lunch in some schools, and I'm not sure how we are planning on um, addressing that. That's one. Um, I also want to make sure that we're looking at all schools, not one neighborhood or two neighborhoods. And when we talk about a neighborhood staying together, for example, when I'm looking up there, walking distance doesn't apply to some schools, but it applies to others. So say, for example, if we're going to vote on the criteria, does walking distance apply to a choir? It wouldn't, you know, because, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about something that we all could agree on just to make sure that we're all thinking about all the schools. And then the number of times the school or the individuals in these schools have moved, that should also be taken into consideration. Right. And um, keeping, I'll put it in quotes, neighborhoods together. If they could walk, they want to be able to walk to that school. Um, I, I just don't see how we are sending kids past one school to get to another school and moving them from one school that they're at right now, which is closer to them, to another school that is further away. I, I don't get that. that. That's been, you know, something that I'm stumbling on to understand how it was done. Yes. I agree with that, and that was, one of the, that was one of the things that we were trying to avoid, right, by doing this, so. Right. And that is the first, not that they're listed in priority order, but that is right. the first thing on the list, Pro proximity of schools to students residents and I believe that was one of the criteria that the consultants informed us that they used that one I remember mm -hmm. okay although I think we all would have an example or more than one example within our individual districts where that did not um, apply correct mr. Cater so some of my I know you guys got my email um, so you, you've seen it, but I'll, I'll just kind of go over it a little bit. Um, 
I so the schools were set to 85.6% utilization um, at the four-year hard number. So that that criteria was put above everything um, and at the expense of other criteria being overlooked. Um, and I don't, the board never kind of gave that direction. So I think as a board, we need to decide where, at what percent do we want our schools? Does that percentage override other criteria? You know, must we keep it at 85% at the risk of driving further? Or, uh, so you get the idea with that. That's something I, I think we need to decide as a board before we move forward. Um, the feeder patterns are huge for me. I think taking a look at feeder patterns and, and, and the fact that they weren't even looked at, I don't want to harp on, on negative things, but looking at those feeder patterns can solve some of the other issues. If, if we're taking those into account and kind of fixing those, yes, I understand it's an elementary redistricting, but it can speak to some of the other criteria on here. Um, <clears throat> so I think that ties in and I think it's very important. Um, additionally, and I've mentioned this before, uh, driving the roads, traffic patterns are critically important, um, especially in our county. Um, but more than traffic patterns, understanding our roads, um, how you actually drive to a school, because when you look at the colors on a map, though they may connect to each other so it doesn't appear that there are islands, there are islands created um, in our current in, in both Plan A and Plan B, there are islands um, just because of dri actual driving routes. Um, so those are some things that need to be looked at and uh, fixed before I can approve any plan. Um, and let me just make sure that I've covered all of my concerns. Um, I, I, I don't want to sound rude, but I think we also need to talk as a board about the work, whose who's responsibility is what, um, the workload that's being put on Mr. Horan and Mr. Townsend. Um, when we initially decided that we were going to outsource, um, that was because their office has a lot of stuff <laughs> coming up. We have the um, North Star getting ready to open. We are starting school earlier this summer and they're busy and so we did hire a consultant and I want to make sure that things aren't coming back to their office that can be done by the consultant because if they are why did we outsource so I hope that doesn't sound too harsh but I think it's important that we really um, you know delineate whose job is is whose thank you thank you miss miss hazard did, it, did they jump over you? Oh, we'll go back. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because I, I was just first. Yes. <laughs> Ladies first okay. tonight. Because um, I'm going to steal one of your usual ones. So, um, so I will say that we'll do this one together. Because, <laughs> Mr. Mc, I, I have several comments um, about things that I think we could could look at. Um, one that um, came up, and this came up very much in the high school redistricting, um, is about neighborhoods that have not been built and um, if there are areas of neighborhoods that have not been built or they are being phased in it would be nice to have those called out somewhat easier I mean I probably know some of them in Hartwood but and all of you know your areas but I mean we can all sit here and share that but that information I believe should be available based on whatever you all pulled from Mr. Harvey's office across the street of, you know, what's in phase one, what's in phase two, what has been built? Because in some sense, that can help the board also make some decisions. Um, and I'm not saying this needs to be one of the criteria, but I have to say, if I don't have to move 3,825 children, I would prefer not to. If there are ways we can keep people in schools they're in, because there are neighborhoods that in four years we are projecting out, I might make a different decision on, on that. So I don't know if that is information we can, 
I mean, I, I mean, I can help look at them, but I, I just think that that's important, especially because I know that's something with the growth we're experiencing. Do we want to at least, there's one that sticks out very easily to me that is easy to move and it fixes the feeder pattern, but that I don't want to go into, and it just screams to me that it's an easy fix. But that's one that I think as a board would be something, so Mr. McCosker, did I steal yours? I'm sorry, because that's usually one you, <laughs> you give. Um, uh, feeder patterns we've touched on, but I think something that the board really has to figure out is it has become blaringly or glare, excuse me glaringly apparent that the special education um, work that has been done and presented to us is a significant driver to some things and I'm almost wondering if we as a board are going to have to approve that first and I will say partly um, when I look at Rocky Run who take who goes from right now a, a single um, special education or a contained classroom that under the proposal they will go to four, I need to be sure that that has been taken into, a, in, into account that those are three new classrooms potentially taken out of service. And that may have, have been done, but I'm just saying that decision may be one we are gonna have to make upfront I don't know, I, I, and I, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm not sure, but if we are moving those classrooms and adding those classrooms, which has been talked about, how do we make sure those have been in, included in our, in our capacity? Because that's three, I mean, I, I so. But I, I'm just saying that we didn't have that information when we started this process. Okay. This came part way through. So it's just something, like I said, it may, it, you all may say that is included in the new, projections, but I'm just saying, is that going to be a decision we as a board are going to have to make early so we can come up with <laughs> real capacity at some of the schools if we are moving these programs? And please know, I am not saying that we are adopting it, and this is nothing against the work and the great work done by our, um, our staff. I do have some thoughts about um, Moncure in that particular, um, and I've raised that 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 was designed, it seemed to have a certain number, and, but we can talk about that, that's more of a specific. And I would say the only final thing I'll say, at least at this point, is when we talk about proximity and the issue of con contiguity, I think there's two ways to look at that. And I appreciate that the consultant showed us pictures of schools with non-contiguous things. But I would say as a parent, I'm thinking more, is my neighborhood contiguous to going to either one school or two schools? And I think it's a reverse. I think it, I don't, I, I'm just saying, I, I think then it's a different look at it. It's not the school zone. Those were created by us. The neighborhoods weren't created by us. But if I'm a parent, I'm not looking at, well, does this school zone, and I'm not saying those aren't anomalies and we shouldn't look at them. But if I'm looking at it as a resident, I'm like, does my area take some pattern out of that area to same middle schools, same high school? May not, both may not, because we have 17 elementary schools. So I, I but it's sort of a, a different view of how to look at proximity of schools to student residents. And I don't know if that makes any sense, but it to me seems like the school zone look, it really should be our citizen look. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. Or is that really confusing? <laughs> no, no, this, this is a time to talk. I mean, we're not going to come up with the solutions right now. But this is an opportunity for all of us to talk about what our concerns are, what our observations are, and perhaps what we'd like to see come back. You know, we're not, as you said, you know, you could name one, but we're not saying move this one and, and that one, but we're, we're talking generally, and I think this is very helpful. Um, and I, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm in agreement with most of the things that I've heard. I mean, I, I think we all share the concerns. Um, we just need to communicate them to the consultant, but give some direction. You know, we, you know this, this is first just laying it all out there 
then we're going to have to, to narrow it down or, or to prioritize. We're not going to say there's nothing there that's not important, but we have to say what, what we want to see prioritized. At, at least that, that's my take on it. But no, and, I, I, I. And we may say we want prioritized under Plan C this stuff, and, I, and I'm just making this up, Plan D prioritize this stuff so we can see it run two different ways. Now we're, we are going to have to be on a pretty short I know, I'm track saying. here, but, <coughs> but that'll be something else. Mr. McOsker, it's your turn. Sure. I, boy, I get a turn already. That's great. <laughs> start the clock, uh, Ms. Start the, start the clock. No, I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to keep it to process. Um, I think we need to look at, uh, you know, to make sure that we're all in agreement, and I think Saturday we'll talk about the timeline make sure we're all okay with with the timeline that is presented and we've got to come up staff needs to come to us and tell us why we, we can i can't do the timeline for redistricting um, right now it's i understand it's a can uh, the number two is um i think we need to look at uh schools that are opening above 90 percent initially i think that's a tough one to uh, swallow um, when we're doing all this hard work and and we see schools at 94 90 and, and even 97 and some of the plans and maybe that's a criteria where it needs to be screened out, you know, um, like if that we just can't allow that to happen. Um, you know, it shows uh, the seven year look shows uh, us the, the snapshot from next year to or this year to 2025, 20, 26. So we need to um, kind of make sure that that 85 percent, if we can keep it in there, that that that's kind of what I thought we, we were looking for. So. Um, that's an issue. Some other um, issues that I, um, I want to talk about is, you know, I think uh, it, the board's already mentioned it, but we do need to look at bus rides. We do need to look at these long, these long uh, rides into um, into the schools to make sure that we're not, um, you know, have a kid on there 90 minutes, right? And taking a, take into effect traffic. And because you know that, you know, I know in uh, Mr. Decatur's district specifically, if that bus takes that left out of this building and goes down Route 1, there, it gets ugly real quick, right, during, in the morning. And there's a lot of other places like that. So we need to kind of take that into consideration. And I think lastly, and then I'll be quiet um, uh, on, on the process, is um, I've gotten a lot of emails about our uh, l um, low incidence programs, um, um, autism, EBS, learning support. And so um, I'd just like to take another look at, you know, um, I, you know why are we moving him? Why is it, why is this so important that we move these programs in certain schools and certain th and and, and um, is that the best is that best suited for our community? So those are my those are my points. And Dr. Chase, do you, you want to? I know you sent us an email, <laughs> but uh, you know for the record, we can summarize sure. or add what you want. Yeah, um, I I shared with the school board um, just a few concerns, and they were. Um, more general concerns. So, for example, I can't support opening the new Moncure at 97% capacity, 50% um, free and reduced lunch, um, because we're setting that school up to fail. And, and so I can't support that. Um, and uh, in looking at f f which schools become class size reduction and which ones already are class size reduction, we need to be taking that into consideration as well. Um, and it's tricky, and I understand that it's tricky. So those are sort of my, my two big things. May I? Sure. Um, while we're throwing out suggestions and, and comments, um, one of um, my parents, or Jamie's parents, um, spent a lot of time working on at least the, the northern half of um, Stafford and how it, how it equates to what's going on here on the 610 corridor. And what I would like to do is she's a researcher, um, doctoral candidate. This is what she does. Um, I would like the, the uh, consultant to at least look at her work and if any of it makes sense, put it into an option or incorporate it into an option or, but she spent a lot of time with it and I would like to respect that and have it looked at. For as, as a consideration sure uh, I would just respond to that I, I do believe it's been sent to Arkbridge already um, however if it's you know if, if the board would like to let them know that it's more of a priority to have them look at certain things depending on um, 
Yeah, so I, I guess they could analyze it and when we meet with them, I guess give us their synopsis of it. Well, I would ask the board to give direction to the contractor to consider every single comment that came in from the public because a lot of those comments have suggestions. Now, it may relate to a particular area, but, you know, I don't want to give priority to one over another one because I've seen a lot of suggestions that make sense. And, and the best suggestion that came to me, I wouldn't say the best, but certainly the most memorable was from someone in my district that lives across the street, literally across the street <coughs> from the elementary school they're in now, and they were redistricted. So they're gonna have to get on the bus, go away from the school across the street. But, but the, comment, the, um, the comment was, I hope common sense prevails. So you know, that, that would be you know, my hope here as well, you know, common sense along with all our criteria, but let's not just move areas to get to a number. And, and that's, that, that's my biggest concern about the plan, you know, in the areas, and, and I'm focusing in, in my district because that's what I'm certainly most familiar with, although I am reading every single email. And I can identify, particularly with the, you know, the, the long bus rides. I mean, why are we moving kids this way instead of <laughs> the way the traffic goes, um, but but there are a number of instances that that looked to me that it was just reaching to get that percentage. You know why move a, an area that is closer to three schools to the fourth farthest school, other than to get to that magic number? So that's I think I've heard that from you know the board, but that would be you know my request. <coughs> is that we certainly aim for a percentage, but that should not be the whole basis for a proposal, for, for having that there. But on this, the same token, I, I wouldn't want to start at, at 90% either. 97%. Um, but I, I, had a, I had a discussion, I, I got permission, oh, and I, I talked to Mr. Townsend this afternoon because um, someone in my district had, had raised a question, how did we get in both proposals. And the consultant responded. Um, it said we were all copied on it, but I didn't get the response. I, I went to the, yeah, I know, I didn't get it either. Um, but I went to the, um, the, the site on the board docs that the public is welcome to go to as well, which has all the comments, all the emails that are coming into us, and anything from the consultant you know, back is on there. And the, um, the, the uh, constituent had asked for the numbers for his particular subdivision. And when the numbers were given back, I said, hmm, you know, it didn't make sense to me. So I talked to Mr. Townsend and we talked about a couple other ones. And, you know, I have some questions about the numbers. And he explained to me that these projections came from a, a different consultant that we hired last fall. And that overall, you know, they're fairly accurate. And I, I get that, I'm happy. You know, countywide, they're <clears throat> accurate. But if they're not accurate, if they're way off in a particular subdivision or two subdivisions or 10 subdivisions or, you know, streets, that could be a problem because we're looking four years out. And if they say we're gonna increase by 50% and we all know, you know, certain subdivisions are gonna increase by maybe 200% and some are gonna increase by 10% or maybe decrease and they show it going up 50. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting we're going to be able to solve that, but, but I think it's important that, that we be looking at that because we know our schools and we know our neighborhoods Madam Chair. because we live there. Yes. Madam Chair, permission? Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'm uh, comments also, and I don't know who could give me the answers, but um, did we do anything with the feedback so far that we've gathered? Did we, I think we talked about putting them in some kind of a, and I, I don't know if the consultant could hear me. Um, did we do anything with them yet? Put them in some kind of a correlation, um, like questions? Um, did we analyze them yet? Like, what are we waiting yeah. for? Like, what? I asked for that. Is yeah. this a question for me? Yes. Preeta, right? Preeti? This is Preeti. Is this question, is this question for me? Yes. Yes, for okay. you. 
what we did was we compiled all the emails into a Word document, and we also prepared an Excel spreadsheet in which we identified the issue, the school, the subdivision, and uh, yes, yeah, so we have a spreadsheet and a Word document with complete uh, email content. Okay, so what would be our next steps with that? Well, can I, I'm, I'd like this is um, uh, Patricia Healy. I have a question of that. You have the spreadsheet. Is there any change that you would make uh, in response to those comments or any proposals that you, you would uh, There are some uh, planning units that we are we are actually exploring, looking at all the comments that we have received from uh, the community. Most of the comments are that they do not want to move. Okay, then there are some specific comments for about so I still have some the neighborhoods that we have uh, heard in the town hall meetings. And we are looking at the feasibility of reassigning them. And at, for, at a glance, some of them look very reasonable so we are going to we are evaluating their feasibility and and that's based on all the um, comments that have come in in the email as well as from the town hall meetings uh, yes ma'am okay. we have received about um, I, I want to say around 200 emails uh, and we have looked at all of them we have analyzed them and we have read the emails to determine what the issue is so yes we are analyzing them we are looking at the feasibility of reassigning whatever neighborhood it is possible in plan a as well as in plan b okay okay Ms. Young, yes um, Preeti I had another question um, I'm trying I'm not trying to talk too loud but I want you to be able to hear my question um, I wanted you to be here to show me the tool, and unfortunately, you're not. So I'm not sure if this question could be answered, but like, in, this question was asked by the public. Plan A and Plan B look similar in terms of numbers, except, you know, the area is a little larger when um, the redistricting was done. Where did you start? Like, did you start like in the north or in the south and then moved around to the west? Like, why are they so similar? And if you start somewhere else, will it still give you the same result? Like, is it based off the criteria? If you change the criteria, then you will have a different output? Or um, would that not matter? Okay, first of all, I want to say that uh, I really wanted to be there today, but the weather did not cooperate for us. Uh, um, I would like to... Uh, get another opportunity where I could show you the process because I can sit here and describe it to you. But if you provide me with an opportunity to show you the tool and the process, I think it would make things more clear. And uh, we were asked if we are available on Saturday morning. And we have said that we could be there between 9 and uh, noon time. So we would really like that opportunity. And uh, to answer the other part of your question, yes, we used the same redistricting criteria, and we looked at different ways so that we could provide you with the different scenarios. And uh, the process was we started, we started with the school which had the highest capacity, which were over capacity. And in this case, you know, looking at the current data, we had Winding Creek and we had Rocky Run. So we started with Winding Creek, which is currently at 96.93% capacity. And in 2019-2020, it is projected to be at 109.31%. So we started with Winding Creek, and we looked at what are the schools, neighboring schools, which school can provide relief to Winding uh, Creek, and then we went around and we looked at each planning unit that, would, that was adjacent <clears throat> to the neighboring school and that if it could provide relief. 
determining which planning units can be moved to which school. And we looked at program capacity of the school, the number of students in the planning unit, and then we looked at proximity to schools and then assigned the planning unit to the closest school as closest school as much as possible. We looked at neighborhoods and uh, we looked at planning units and we saw if any particular neighborhood was being split. And uh, if it was split, then we, thought we looked at another planning unit to, so that we could keep the neighborhood together. Then we looked at street center line files to determine if bus routing could be a potential issue. We, and uh, once, once we were done, then of course we validated our uh, uh, plans with the, with the SCPS uh, uh, subject matter experts, which included the transportation department. We kept uh, checking the capacity in each of the giving and the receiving schools to make sure it was close to 85.6%. And uh, then we also looked at uh, physical, geographical islands and disconnected areas that you have, and uh, we tried to connect them. And uh, this was our process. And uh, then after we were done with one school, we went to the next school. And so like we started with Winding Creek, so. We then, after doing Winding Creek, we said, okay, now let's look at the next school, which is over capacity or which is projected to be over capacity. And we kept repeating this uh, process. And uh, for Stafford County, what happens is you have Rocky Run, which is at 97, you have Winding Creek, which is at 96%, um, but the schools which have low capacity, like Garrisonville, Rock Hill, Barrett, they're up in the north. <laughs> and so when we make a change, it kind of impacts the other schools also because we are trying to move things and use the capacity at these three schools that I mentioned. So uh, this is the process that we use. It's a very logical, reiterative process because once we move a planning unit, and keep in mind that we are working only with planning units. So it's a very logical reiterative process. And once we look at it, we go back and we revisit it. And of course, we were targeting 85.6%. And I, like I said, you know, if uh, we get an opportunity, I would really like to come by and show that to you. Thank you, Priti. Uh, Dr. Chase. Um, so I, I wanted to pull it back to um, considering a plan that somebody in the community has created. Um, and and uh, while I appreciate the, the input and the effort, I, I do think it's important if we're talking about having an independent process that, um, you know, we, we put out an RFP for a consultant and um, I think going with a plan that uh, individual who, who may be trying really hard to be objective, may not be completely unbiased in what their, their goals are. And so I would just say I, I feel like we need to be a little bit careful about that. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to, to say that the consultant keeps talking about Winding Creek being at 96 percent. Winding Creek currently is over 100 percent capacity. It might have been at 96 percent in September, but that is no longer the case. And, and I want to stress that because a lot of people are, are not sure why we're doing this um, and couldn't we wait, um, but we really do have to provide relief uh, to these schools that are, are, are really over capacity. Mr. Cater. Yes, and I, I do appreciate that, and, and I, I agree as well. Um, I think if there are some good points of, of anyone's, anyone's plans that have been brought forward, I, I want to make sure that we are considering all of those. Um, I want to take it back because I, um, and I'd really like to get some sort of general consensus on this one. I forgot um, to mention, because it was in a separate email, um, another one of my major concerns is that we, the concern is that we will appro approve a redistricting and lumped into that redistricting approval is the special ed um, 
transfers. And so my question is, I, I question statement, I want to make sure that our if we are going to move any of these classrooms or programs to other schools, um, I want to make sure that that is a vote independent of the vote that we are taking for the redistricting process. And if that is the case, and we can do that, because I think it deserves, I, I think it deserves a very close look at who we are moving, where, why, how many times have they been moved before, all the same things, but an independent look. Um, and if we can do that, and you guys agree, I, I guess that has to be done before, um, like you said. So I, I didn't want us to comb over that um, and not really come to a conclusion or an agreement. I have a question I'd like to raise with respect to that. Um, Dr. Kisner, was the special ed proposal done before the plans or after the plans? I got the impression it was done after the plans came to us. When when was that proposal done? Because the first time well, I saw it was when I walked into one of the town hall meetings. Let, let me touch upon the special ed plan. So the current placements of our low incidence programs are mainly, not all the time, due to where we had open space, okay? This was an opportunity to work with possibly 350 children. We've heard from about 20 and we respect every single one of their feedback. We saw an opportunity to place those programs where we thought would be the greatest benefit for the children in those current programs and looking down the road. Acknowledging that as you're experiencing with the general population, People like where they are. So we, so we then work with the consultants to say this is where we believe the program, that's why A and B have the same distribution, have the same placements of the programs. So then we factored in where there would be lost capacity because we would have a special ed uh, room there or greater capacity because it would be removed. Now, Wendy and I did meet this morning, not tonight, but um, we are prepared on Saturday to present another proposal based on the feedback. And we are also looking at some of the emails, like all of you have been, of some individual students where we think the parents have a very valid concern and try to address those student by student because that's what we should do for every student, but we absolutely do that for children with disabilities. So I, I just want to put the big picture in that uh, this was obviously before I arrived here, but looking at past minutes and everything and, 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 and documents, in many cases, I don't want to say all, the, where they are located now because that was where available spaces. And we saw this as an opportunity to improve that, improve upon that, and um, you are correct. If, uh, I'm not sure if anybody ever said this, but you would be correct to say if we just left it as it is, we could do that too. We would just have to work with the consultants to make it adjustments, but we don't think that is really, if we use proximity as one of the criteria, which I would have asked you to go back to Edith's first comment. As I look at that board, listen to everybody's comments, you have about 11 other criteria that you guys seem to want. And it seems to be even the question of, are we still staying with 85 or, or 90%? So to help, um, I think I would ask you so we don't sit back there a couple weeks, still not squeeze, just to narrow it down exactly what we want. But saying that, um, we are prepared to do what we do. We would prefer to do what we think is, we would like to keep this out of the process in a sense, because we think that this um, uh, is a better way of addressing the needs of our students. And one of the requirements is to for children with disabilities to be as close as possible to their to their um, communities, their school neighborhoods. But we also acknowledge that we, we believe we can make some tweaks. And we have already, Wendy has already worked with uh, Matt and, and to tell the consultants, if we did that, then this school is going to either lose the classroom or another school classroom is going to be gained. So I guess I'm just sharing, we're ready to do what the board wants. I feel very comfortable 
<laughs> that, yeah, we got to remind you the mic. So I, I, I don't know. Just, just real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys have heard me enough, but you're going to um, you're going to work with us. Yeah, we're going to work with you, and, and you're going to work with the team. Uh, yeah, Wendy yeah. Martin Johnson. All right, but but to go back to Mr. Cater's question, I just want to that's what clarify I was gonna, this before we right. That's what I, that's where I'm. I, I I didn't. I never thought we were voting on the uh, special ed as part of the redistricting proposal A or B. I I think this is something that we need to look at. Independently and hypothetically, it if we are up. at it's you know the 85 percent target, there should be room in every single school for special education programs at least. Well, that that, that, that was my point, Madam Chair, that I wanted to uh, address with Mrs. Katakater is that um, it, it has to, it, it'd be nice if every if all the schools were projected to be at 85 percent in Plan A and Plan B or the next plan, then then maybe a class or two would not be a big deal. However, let's take Ferry Farm, for example, uh, opening at 90% on Plan A and 94% with Plan B, and that was with the removal of the one autism class. And so that equates to the, you know, the autism, if the autism class stayed there, there'd be eight students in that classroom. But now that the autism class is removed from Ferry Farm, it's 26, and then the difference, eight minus 26 is it. So that would actually push my percentage up in Plan A if we don't take, if we don't kind of, um, address the um, uh, as part of the redistricting. Okay, I guess I guess that's my argument. If we don't address this as part of the redistricting, we're not going to have um, accurate percentage numbers to actually say, hey. So I mean, would ninety? No, but we, would ninety five percent be okay? It, it, I it mean, is embedded in the numbers that you have. I guess it's, it it's, has been factored. So well, the currently, yes, currently. And, yeah, and, and a, so what I'm saying is when we make a decision a yeah. on Saturday to say we are going to add extra classrooms, I'm saying there's there's a second order effect that you're going to get a percentage increase or decrease yeah. uh, on the schools. Yeah. That's that's all I'm saying. Yeah, so it, well it isn't quite as independent as... I, I guess I'll just renew what my first comment was tonight, that I think that that plan drives some of where we go. And that's why I was saying I thought that needed to be addressed first. I mean, that's kind of where I was trying to take us. And then I would, I, I am very open to hearing what our experts say. That's what, I mean, that's why we're here. But I also do think we need to look at, it is my understanding, and I don't, didn't bring everything <laughs> that we all have on all this stuff, you know, if we are also building schools to accommodate programs too, I also think we need to make sure that we are, um, also honoring that too, because it, some it sounds like Moncure was built to have a certain number there. Now, that may mean we know where the growth will go next, but I believe when we start looking at and we build new schools that have that and we are using them for general ed classrooms, that puts a lot of um, issue or, or um, capacity on cafeterias, gymnasium. So if we have assumed we would have seven special ed classrooms in a building and now four or five of them are gen ed, that's gonna have a, a, a bigger a, a bigger issue. So it's just, I think we wanna, I don't wanna say balance, but look at what we're building because I think we know that our schools in the future need to have spaces for these programs because I believe even Ms. Martin Johnson said, you know, in two to three years we could have an autism program in every class, in, in every school. So. I think we need to be thinking broadly there. So, you know, I agree with everybody. I think that's a, I think that's a decision point we have to probably make sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I, and I guess why I'm a little confused is I thought we'd made this decision. Um, I thought right at the very beginning of this process, we said that we wanted special ed located where it should be rather than where there was space, and we asked staff to do that, and they did that, and so. Now we're saying that we want to mucky around with what staff has done. And um, it's not my area of expertise. Um, and I would personally be really insulted if it was my area of expertise and everybody was telling me that um, we shouldn't do that. So I, 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 I certainly think that I'm happy to hear that 
staff has looked at what people are asking for and has made tweaks. But I don't know whether we want to push this process out so much further by um, getting more involved than, than maybe we're um, qualified to be. And I, I have a, a, a comment on that. If the assignments were made based on where the students are today, those students are not going to be in elementary school. A lot of them won't be in elementary school four years from now. They may be in a different place. So what do we do then? I thought we were somewhat <laughs> trying to centralize um, within the county where we were going to offer certain programs to cut down on the distances that the students would have to, to travel because in the past we have put them where there was room. But in, you know, in, a, in a perfect world where there was room everywhere, where would they best go? Now, if, if you want to say your criteria is going to go put them where the students are today, then that means every year you should relook at it and see where the students are, if, if, if that's the plan you're going to follow. So I, I, I didn't realize it was already in there because the first time I saw it was walking into one of the town halls, and here's a sheet of paper that people had, and I said, oh, my gosh, gee, where'd you get that? And they go, oh, it's the front desk. I said, oh, okay. And just so you know, there, there was a request by someone to bring that forward. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, no. Yeah, we, we, we are complying with your request. So why it was a surprise, because, well, anyway. No, we, I'm, not, not, I'm not criticizing. Yeah. I'm just saying that okay. I, if I wasn't aware of it and I'm part of the process, yeah. then, you know, how could, you know, the, the, the citizens know, yeah. you know, what was done. And, and I, you know, I'm hearing that the criteria is closest to where the students are today. But I do question that because our population is increasing. Our, we all know from our subdivisions, as the students grow older, you know, and, and move out of school, a lot of times the families stay in those houses and there's no new students coming in. They're moving somewhere else. So it's something to think about, you know, what we're going to do at some point in the future. That, that's why I was saying I see it as a separate, um, you know, vote, so to speak, because I don't want to tie in this special education which if we go back to December, you know, I, I remember saying this is really important and to a certain extent, I know redistricting is hard on everybody, but on the special ed students and their families, it is even more taxing and challenging. And I know you so, know this transportation is part of their special ed services, so we could transport children completely different than we do for the general ed population. Yeah. Well, anyway, I just, I, I think we, we need to get some consensus, as Ms. Decatur has asked, you know, how do we want to, you know, address this? Can, can we address it independent of voting on an option, whether it's A through Z, whatever we end up with, um, you know, look at the special education independently. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's, that's all I'm asking. asking. And just to clarify, I don't want to mucky around with anything. <laughs> I just... Feel exactly, I just feel exactly the same way. The first time I saw it was, you know, at a presentation, you know, with, with the rest of the redistricting stuff. And I believe it deserves a little bit more attention. I want to know who, what, when, where, and why. And if they've been moved three times in four years, I'm not doing that. So I want to make sure that I know everything that's happening with that. And if I'm voting on an entire Plan A redistricting or Plan Z and it's stuck in there, and I'm focusing on Plan Z and not all of these other children. I just want to make sure that we're focusing on, on ev all of it. Um, and that's all. That's My time's up. <laughs> that, that was a process foul. We have, a, we have 15 minutes left in this conversation. I say again, 15 minutes. Ms. Egan wants to go home. No, you can't go home because you fell out. That was the. <laughs> I did not do that on purpose. That was well, on purpose. You know it is 9 o'clock. And that was the, okay. we're going to hold this on Saturday. We can continue meeting. this okay. tonight, but we, can, we, we really on? can talk about it. Okay. If we could get a little bit more of a rundown of who, what, when, where, why on Saturday, yeah, then that would let's be great. Let's do that. Dr. Kisner, is that? We'll give you everything you need. I, I'd right. like to hear from one more board member so, still. So what, before, yeah. before we go to that procedurally, I just want to make sure we're going to, um, we're going to notice a, another work session on Saturday. Since the consultants are only available 9 to 12, why don't we move the, um, the budget work session to follow the work session on the redistricting? Is that agreeable? Yeah.
Yeah. Can, I, can I make a uh, Ms. comment? Young. I'd like uh, to hear Madam from Ms. Young. Young. Is that that's agreeable? Yes. Well, what yeah. is agreeable? Go, what, what, go what are you asking? Saturday. We're going. We're going to have. We're going to notice yeah, a work session sure on are. Saturday. To well, we're still going tonight, but I'm sure we're not going to finish to have the consultants come down. Um, Dr. Kisner can get us the uh, the special ed additional information, and the consultants can talk about and show us their uh, the process, and then we can talk about what we're looking for from them. Unless you want to give them direction tonight. All right. Did you? Is there anybody who hasn't Just, had more turns? Who, who's next? <laughs> Miss Young. Miss Young. Young. You Whew. again. You again? Really? <laughs> you know what? Patricia I'm Healy. You. Oh, I'm just teasing really. you. Really. You know what? I, I, I just wanted to comment uh, on the great work that the staff had done and, and the fact that I didn't even think about. I thought, oh, all the kids are going to have, you know, you know, good attention and where they're going to move. And when they say special, you want parents to feel that all the kids are being considered equally. And, and yes, their special attention are giving to them. But I thought it was, uh, I admired the staff that they took time and was able to give us that information separate and apart and say, this is what we did with the kids. So thank you for that, Wendy, and your team. Um, the question I have, and it's a little bit different, and it's going to Scott. I don't have my paperwork. I'm doing a holly. <laughs> when is our next school supposed to open? Next elementary school? Come on, Scott, pick the date. I guess I'm, I'm just trying to because. I assume. Are you talking Mark here? No. no. <laughs> the the new number 18. Number 18. Okay, based on the pr information that we provided to the board and based on the board approval yeah, of the CIP. Me Go ahead. The, the CIP uh, list. Um, using the new progr program capacities, yeah. we are not, sh and using a trigger of 100%, which is all debatable. I know oh, there's We been never a lot approved of, that. Well, that's the current trigger that we used as part of, and that's why there's not an elementary school 18 on. Um, okay, that but, needs to be changed. But, you have, but the school board does not approve that. The list that Correct. you provided, okay. uh, that we provided to the Board of Supervisors, had elementary okay. school 18 on it. Okay. Um, but the program capacity, that um, was approved, barring the trigger. Um, if we used 100%, it wouldn't be within inside the 10-year window. If okay, we used so trigger, so so I don't have an answer for so you. So we have a couple of schools at 100% right now, and if our trigger is supposed to be just hypothetically it's supposed to be 80, um, we would we should have a school on the docket at some point in time. 19, uh, 20 yeah, so what? <coughs> 20. Fairness to Scott, spring of 2018. Microphone. Oh, sorry. Um, spring, oh, I'm gonna, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, spring of spring of 2018 at the administrative level. See, it's easy for me to say that because I wasn't here. At the administrative level, there was a an agreement to do 100% of the aggregate. So not when a school hits 100%, when all 17 schools reach 100. Last week's meeting with the vice with the chair and vice chair and the uh, chair and, I guess, vice chair of the Board of Supervisors, we had a discussions about this because the, um, uh, the, comp uh, uh, the comp plan says 90%. I think most of you believe it's 90%. And what actually needs to happen sooner than later is to get clarity, vote on it, they vote on it, and we know that we're talking 90%. And I'll just say one thing and then I really will be quiet. And I'm not even sure that's even the best procedure. No, but I don't get all my questions out. I, I forget them just like yeah, you do. Because the same if we do 90% of the aggregate, you still may have some schools that, are, some communities that are growing much faster, and they may hit 100, 110 percent. I'm not going to be quiet until I'm ready. So, <laughs> so, um, I, I, so I, I think we need to rethink it. But let's all agree. I think everybody's agreeing. The 100 percent is really not I'm something not we're supportive of. Well, Miss <laughs> Hazard, you'll be after Miss Young, like she said. Yeah, I, I wasn't done. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. Okay. Hazard. No, it's okay. So the reason. No, don't sit down yet. So the, so the reason why I'm asking this is because. We, we have this plan out for, and I'm not trying to change all this redistricting thing, I'm just trying to get us to think a little bit about what we're doing here. So we, we should have a school on the docket to be built because here again we're trying to move the kids and then when a, a new school opens up, when it has to, we're going to move them again. You bet. 
And so I'm thinking what we should be looking at is having that school, knowing which kids are supposed to be in that new school and making sure that we're not moving them. And if that area where they're living in is gonna be overcrowded, maybe this is where we need to get our little um, trailers or something like that to, to make sure that they're there in that area when they uh, when the new school opens up, they will be right there. They're still in the neighborhood, and it's not a big movement because to me right now, there are too many kids moving, and they will have to move again. And this is not what we want if we're looking at the list of walking distance, feeder pattern, contiguous attendance areas, and socioeconomic characteristics of school populations. That's all. I know my long-winded talk before about trying to explain um, <clears throat> when the consultant talked about the methodology, and I'm not saying that that is not a, 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 a great way to do it, but it actually illustrated what I was trying to say in my point, is we were starting with the school moving out. Is there a way that we can look at, we start with each of the schools and say, within some distance, let's make sure all the walking zones go to that school and you start there with each of the schools understanding that we have some schools that are at 100 percent but there are still going to be schools I mean I know I'm just going to use Hartwood there is not a way that a person at the Falkier line should be sent to Falmouth or pick somewhere else there are some people we are not going to move and I was always hoping that that amount of people was going to be 70 to 80 percent like that of people that aren't moving and you all said let's see like about a quarter of the elementary school kids would move yes. I, I'm, I'm doing wild rounding that's that's uh, that, yeah. I mean so is there a way to look at how to do this to minimize that by looking at it with school and proximity to the school and then I get it we're going to get somewhere and I know it may not be a circle, but this I'm a visual. At some point, some of those circles, we're going to go, oh, that ship puts that school at 125% or whatever it may. So we'll know that there are some areas that are on the f fringes of these circles that it might get to what I think a lot of the emails we are seeing is, I'm not close to where I'm going. Does that make any sense? I'm, maybe that helps what my comment was so, earlier. So, so have a radius. Something. As, or as, something. As a starting point. Actually, that's what I was thinking as well. But that was what I was trying to say with my point of saying we started with the school. And that's the proximity and close to school. I think we're all getting a um, notice from yeah. Yeah. Oh, Stafford <laughs> County Public delay, Schools. Is it delay I, I didn't or answer canceled? mine, but. Um, yeah. Delay? The problem what? with that, though, is like reassessed. No, there's no release. Two hour, two hour delay. I'm just saying, if we are looking potentially of running something new, because some of the comments we're hearing that A and B are so similar, this may not work. They may, it may be run that way and say, this is really a disaster. But that's just conceptually how I think. Well, and there's a lot of people that talk about fairness. Um, you know, if you're if you're near a school. Why shouldn't you go there? You can and, walk and to it, right? Right, or, or, or your house has been there for years, and right. you know, you've always been at that school. Can, um, can I ask a quick question? On the backs of that comment, did they take into, the, into consideration the discussion that we had on preemptive redistricting? Did that come into play at all? Because that was something I was very specific about. Oh, right. She might have signed off. Maybe she's already there. Time to go. <laughs> that was Mather. I, I'm here. Did you hear? Did you hear my question, ma'am? Can you say it again, please? Um, we had um, during one of our work sessions with you, we had discussed doing um, incorporating some. Um, um, what did I call it? Preemptive. Thank you. It's late preemptive uh, redistricting um, based on what was on the books going forward. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> um, 
was that taken into consideration and is that, is that included in this, in the plan A or the plan B? I'm not sure what you mean by preemptive redistricting. Can you explain that to me? It was the comment I made at the beginning about not neighborhoods that aren't built yet. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. How are you, how are you reallocating some of the expected people, kids, coming into the schools in the, in the near years? Uh, we are just looking at uh, the projection data. And uh, the projection data should, are you talking about new subdivision? Correct. Okay. That is uh, incorporated in the projection. Could, couldn't so, couldn't we minimize the number of kids we move if we do more of the preemptive? Meaning just move who we have now and then worry about, you know, the 2,000 apartments that are going in and celebrate or whatever it was. Um, l looking at where, we, where we're going to have space and then reallocating those, you know, the, the soon-to-be kids. Kind of like what we did with Embry Mill at the last redistricting. Okay. What, uh, right now we are looking at the fourth year. What we could do is, or what could happen is, it's a suggestion that we could look at the nearer years, like just two years out. So that would uh, exclude those kids, which would probably, apartments being built in like three years, four years. So that way, those kids could be eliminated, not taken into consideration. No, yeah, that's not I think really what I had in I mind. Think, I think if you all would take into account the things that I asked on the neighborhood names, I, if, if you don't have them, Jeff Harvey has them, of what's out there, and we can put them in the APUs, and it may, I think that's the simplest way for us, the board, to deal with it. I, I just wanted to... Yeah, I mean, if there is data that would support it, we, I'm happy to use it. If I could just clarify, we do have all approved subdivisions as of s September of every year incorporated in the projections. Um, as far as the preemptive redistricting, that gets a little tricky because every new proposed or every approved development, as soon as it's approved, doesn't get its own planning unit assigned to it uh, because there may be a 100 acre farm where we're going to have 100 houses come in, but right now it's one house. So every so that for that planning unit is not currently statistically significant to run projections on uh, now so ultimately what happens down the line when it becomes more dense then it gets split off but now um, more than likely most subdivisions are part of a different or an existing planning unit with existing houses tied into it as well I think we need to talk about this a little bit more on Saturday. There, there are several that will fix some problems. I can name them, but I won't do it tonight. Well, be ready on Saturday. Yeah. Um, and I, I just had, I, I, I liked, Ms. Hazard, what you said about um, sort of a circumference around a school. But, but my only concern about that is the APUs might not fit in nice little circumferences. And so then, you know, that, that, that may be why we're sometimes seeing people who live right across the street from the school, if they're in a really large planning unit, while they live right across the street from the school, there might be a hundred houses behind them that don't live right across the street. So, so, uh, but, but I think common sense would hopefully we could work on that. And I, th I think with that, we made them smaller for that, for that reason after the high school that I think it will be less of a problem than when we looked at. And here's the thing, running it sort of like that, let's say it moves 6,000 kids. I can then very easily say to my constituents who are running me saying, we tried it under this and everybody moved. I'm, my hope would be less would move but I'm not, I don't have the computer software, but I think that's a, a theme I keep hearing that I feel like we need to have an answer of, yes, it's better or no, it's worse. And the only way to, to do that is to either run it or see it, because that's the kind of person I am. That's the reason I suggested it. And, and I think there is a reasonable expectation on the part of our community that if you live close, and I'll, I'll leave close undefined at this point, but we can all imagine, you know, not walking because a lot of our streets you can't walk. Um, but if, if you're close to a school, why should you have to be on a bus, go past three other schools to get to the one you're assigned to when we're trying to fix it now? I mean, this is the opportunity 
to try to do the best we can. And I would say that if you're going to be assigned to a school that is fourth farthest from your house, shame on us. And, and just, you know, the example that you gave is a, is a good example, but that doesn't apply to the instance I was talking to because the particular um, subdivision that is right across the street has 25 homes in it and a lot less than that children. So it's, it's the common sense and, and I, I, will, I will, you know, give the, the consultants the, you know, the benefit here of the doubt that they, were, they weren't trying to create these um, difficult situations, but I think they were trying to match the numbers at the end rather than applying common sense. And, and that, you know, if, if, if we're going to give direction at some point, I think we're going to have to be somewhat flexible in those percentages. You know, some, some might be, you know, over, some might not be, but we know our neighborhoods and we know where they're built out and where they're probably not going to increase to the extent of the projections. And this is the discussion I have with Mr. Townsend. I mean, overall, these projections might be very accurate, and I understand they are, but on an individual basis, He's going to look at one for me for a built out subdivision. One APU currently has 23 students built out, mind you. People are there, not going to be a lot of movement probably, but it goes from 23 students today to 60 students four years from now. I'd like to bet on that one not happening. But anyway, you know, but, but there's probably a balance somewhere else, but that doesn't help the people that are in the one that's over projected because they may have to move somewhere else to help fill numbers that, that aren't necessary. So anyway, uh, does anybody else wanna you know, say anything? I, I, I think this has been a very productive discussion. Um, you know, do we wanna to, to ask the consultant to bring anything in particular? Do we wanna give some direction at this point? Bring the tool. Yes, for, to, to, give the, uh, I, I think, to give the example, I think your example for Saturday. And we're and if we do a plan C and D, we cannot kid ourselves. There's a high probability you're going to be impacting families that are not impacted today, mm -hmm. and they have the right to also now voice their concern uh, or or, or yeah, chime yeah. in. So I'm just asking on Saturday we have three hours with them to be as specific as possible of your concern so they could address it. You know sooner than later. Could, could we ask, we and I, I hate to do this, and I assume there's going to be some kind of comp time or overtime, but could we have transportation there? Because I think transportation yes, is a very important issue that's come up for, for all of us, because it's not just, you know, how many miles it is from home to the school, it's what road they're on or what's under construction or, you know, what, where do they have to backtrack? Um, so I, I think that would be helpful or, to, or, or you know, help barrier. us go through. Is there any, anybody else want anything to, my, my question to be is brought for us? Do we need to prioritize any of them and then have them run something before and bring it on Saturday on plan A and plan B? Well, it, it changed. It, have the top at this three? point, we can, we can have discussion. We can't make any decisions because we're okay. in a work session. Now, I, we, perhaps we might want to announce a um, special call meeting at the end of the work session if we do want to make some um, decisions and, and give very specific direction to the board. So I, I think that might be wise if we decide we don't need to have it, we don't have to. So we will schedule the work session to begin at 9, a um, special call meeting um, with the topic of the redistricting mm -hmm. to immediately follow that work session to be followed by another work session on the budget. Oh, I guess we better plan on either going out for lunch or bringing it in. I was just going to say, are we going to be fed? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's very special. <laughs> very special. All right. But, all uh, right, Madam so Chair, just, I just I yes. do have one question yes, process um, again. Uh, will, uh, so they'll bring the tool and uh, will we be able to make on the, on the spot um, inputs to the tool and have them spit out percentages? Um, Arcbridge? 
Miss Freddie. Yeah. Pretty. Hey, will you be? <laughs> will you be able to bring the tool and do on-the-spot corrections to the tool? To the and give us percentages for Have APU. A copy of the of the data. Make a copy and bring a copy of the data, not the real data. What are you What are you talking about? <laughs> what, one at a time. One at a Let time. him finish. You, know, you get your question. No, no, you go ahead, Mr. McOscar. You finish yours, ma'am, and do, then you can go. Will you Will you have the computer software with you so we can make on the spot corrections to APUs? Uh, I can. I will bring the tool. I can show you. I can show you the numbers. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. We We would like that. But, done. I, but I can do it as a demonstration. And then whatever you would like, we can go back, do the numbers, and get them back to you. Scott Haran's going to say something. He now. doesn't look happy. Well, I want to make sure the board understands. She will not be able to make a change in the plan that will affect the entire plan. Right. She can make a change to a certain um, attendance zone, and then they have to manually see how that works across 17 elementary school attendance zones. So it won't be push one button and all of a sudden, brrr, all the numbers change, all the percentages change in real time for you to see. They cannot do that, that okay, on the tool. They cannot do that. But I'll let her speak for herself. Okay, Hold, well, May, real Mr. quick. Mr. Horan, before you go, can I, can I just ask that, I mean, they've got all of the input from all of the citizens, including any 2.0s, any, anything. Um, they have all of the input from all of the board members. Can we send them back to the drawing board and ask them to assess this data, come back to us with a, with a plan that, that fits more closely to what we've asked for now, considering um, feeder patterns, driving the roads, traffic patterns, all of the things that we have just collected and what they've read, and when they are ready, bring it back to us and let us then look at what they have, have processed or <coughs> figured out from all of this because it doesn't make any sense to sit around on Saturday and have this same conversation and play with APUs and say Garrisonville, no, no, Ferry Farm, and we don't want to get into that. So can we just ask them to go back to the drawing board with the information they now have? I am yelling so that you can hear me. I'm not trying to be, like, boisterous. Um, well, did you just can we... <laughs> Can we ask them to go back to the drawing board and bring us? And if, and if Saturday is not enough time, we know that we have to make a decision in two weeks, but if Saturday is not enough time. No, 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 we don't have to make a decision I'm sorry. in two weeks. I'm sorry, sorry. You have to middle March, in my opinion. To okay, say, yeah. if, if Saturday is not enough time for them to do so, well, we've got plenty of other things to do on Saturday. Right, Ms. Hazard. I would like to have the consultant reply and it can come later about the visually di or conceptually different way of doing it from school out. A radius. Yeah. And if in the end they say that doesn't work, I, I can live with that. But that would be a request I would have or at least some analysis of a report back on Saturday, whether that's doesn't work, it does work. Because to me that may create itself a new plan. Right. Just Turn the mic on. Ms. Healy made a comment that I would maybe ask the board to think about, that maybe the 85 percent, we don't have to have standardization of 85 percent, because maybe the other request you want to, and I don't know if this could even be possible, is just look at the families that are impacted today. Is there another plan with just those families. I'm trying to truthfully avoid other families being impacted. So is there a way of maybe reducing the number of families impacted and just, or, or at least change it to where it makes more sense and not all of a sudden drawing more, more families? That's just wondering if that could be well, something. Well, that, that, that's one way to look at it. But I would also like to consider Ms. Hazard's suggestion, and I, I think that goes along with, with everyone's, you know, you know, thinking about that, I think I think Saturday is going to be our opportunity to talk with the consultant and and give more of our thoughts. We've all said a lot tonight, but I know I have more to ask about. Um, and there may be more people in the community between 
now and then that now that they know this is all going to be you know under review and and, and consideration may you know get their thoughts in as well um, and I, I we, we've heard from a lot you know a lot of people a lot of communities but there, there may be you know some others so um, well if we if we come Saturday the consultants going to be prepared to, to give us feedback we can give more thoughts and then we can you know talk about where we want to go to proceed but if there is a possibility Arkbridge that you can look at what Ms. Hazard's you know discussing and I I don't is there any objection on the board to that to, to starting at a school and you know going out Did you ask in, in a radius doable, or, like, well anything that, is doable no, I say doable in terms of time effort Matt and there, Matt and Scott aren't doing this. This is yeah. what we oh, have engaged the consultant to do. No, 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 no. I would, I would say if, you, if you're asking Arc Bridge to do that, give them some criteria as to a radius because we know we can't change the geographic location of our schools. Some schools are very close to each other and some are not. And so then in some of the dense areas up around Park Ridge, Hampton Oaks, uh, Conway, Grafton, yeah. those close schools are very close. So if you say a mile radius, you know, to start with and use that, some are going to overlap if, you, if you're kind of looking at it from a visual. So I would say if you're going to ask them to try to do a product for Saturday under those kind of criteria, let's give them a few, uh, few more things to build on. Well, I think they need to come to us because exactly as you said, you know, where there's dense schools, the radius is going to be smaller. Where a school is more isolated, the radius is going to be bigger. But that's why I'm saying if you are expecting them to bring something on Saturday, you're sending them with homework. We, they don't have anything to go on. So they common they, sense. <laughs> that, that's that they're <laughs> at least we have we have given we have given the concept in my opinion, and I will await if they say I want more guidance from it. But at least it gives I believe the consultant something to think about until we get back on Saturday. And if they say, "Gosh, this makes sense," we could run it. And if they have more questions for us, it's a perfect time for us to dialogue. I second that. <laughs> Budget. Okay, are we adjourned? <laughs> yes. All right. Any any objections to adjourning? Adjourned. We're done. Thank you for tonight. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Good night, Ms. Mather. Good night. Good night.